verse 27. And we find the following for our hearing. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write thou these words, for after the tenor of these words, I have made a covenant with thee and with Israel. And he was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights, and he did neither eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote upon the table, some Bibles say tablets, the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. And it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked, with him. I want to use for a thought today a book so you don't get lost. A book so you don't get lost. Malcolm X is known for a familiar quote that many of us have heard at some point in our lives. If you want to hide something from black people, put it in a book. Malcolm X had dropped out of school in the eighth grade, and that's not an encouragement or a sign. Went to prison where he self-educated himself. He did so by reading any and everything, listen young people, any and everything that he could get his hands on. More specifically, a reading about Africa and blacks in America, books on history and philosophy. There are reports that say that Malcolm X even took the dictionary, read it and wrote it down word for word. And he had no certificates or no diplomas or no degrees, no letters before and after his name. Yet Malcolm X lectured at many major universities. His wife, Betty Shabazz, took a number of his speeches and created one of my favorite books entitled Malcolm X on African American History. And in the book, he deals with the middle passage and talks about the fear tactics of how the white masters and white slave traders and slave owners, three, amen, had different functions and roles and they would take a black pregnant woman and hang her upside down while pregnant and slit her stomach so that the baby would drop from the umbilical cord to create fear. They would separate men from women and parents from children in order to break down the family before they were brought here to the United States, just teaching a little bit. As a child, my mother gave me a book to read entitled Four Took Freedom, The Lives of Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass and Robert Smalls and Blanche K. Bruce. Around the age of 10, one of my favorite books to travel with was a biography on Louis Armstrong. In my teens, I was also introduced to Dr. Maya Angelos, I know why the caged bird sings. And in this book, she talks about what it means to be a black girl, to be raped and to be neglected and to be rejected and not even be heard. Reading books, brothers and sisters and young people kept Malcolm X from being lost and remaining lost and staying lost. There's another book called The Negro Motorist Green Book by Victor Hugo Green that was first printed in 1936. And it stayed in circulation through the 1960s because black people were not free to eat anywhere, restaurants, sleep anywhere, hotels, or gas up anywhere. Where I grew up, we call it filler stations 
Today we might call it convenience stores or gas stations. There was a time that we could not go anywhere without not receiving full and equal service or being denied service or could not travel places without our lives being threatened or falsely arrested or our lives purposely taken. So Mr. Victor Green, a poster carrier, came up with a book to inform black travelers about where they could go and be fully accommodated at first-rate facilities and be safe as they travel. The word travel, brothers and sisters, and by shorthand, how many of you love to travel? I know I do. I love to travel. My wife and I and our family love getting on the road, taking vacations or cruises. Not too many people cruising now, but reunions. What, what I learned about the word travel in English is that it also means travail. Travel is T-R-A-V-E-L. But it also means travail, T-R-A-V-A-I-L, travail. And travail helps us to understand that when you travel, that there are times you can be subject to problems along the way. The Latin root for word travel means torture. When we put all of this together, the word travel, even on vacations and good times and celebratory moments, travels can also, what, become headaches. Sometimes you might need a vacation after the vacation. Travel often have some kind of travail, unpredictable situations. Many people, airplane flights have been, what, canceled. Buses are breaking down on the interstate. A car, even in 2022, can still run out of gas. Tires can still go flat. And every now and again, when you travel, you meet a fool along the way. Some black people needed some guidance in order when they traveled back in those days. Because society, and even now, was filled with racism, there was a book produced to guide them on their destination to make it from point A to point B to stay alive. However, there is another book like the Green Book with the purpose of helping you make it from one destination to another destination. There's another book comprised of 66 books with two divisions called an Old Testament and a New Testament, 37 in the Old and 26 in the New. There's another book where the Old consists of four sections, the law and the history and the poetry and the prophets, where the New consists of four sections called the gospel and the history and the epistles and apocalyptic literature. I need to go back and correct myself. It's not 37, it's 39. Amen. I need to get it right. Amen. Amen. Like the Green Book, this book is not only for black people to navigate and travel the rusty roads of life, but this book is for any and every person, regardless of their color or their skin or their age or their social, economic, political background, and regardless of their gender and their identity and their lifestyles can read this book and learn from the book and learn where to travel and learn where to eat and learn where to sleep and learn where to fuel up. This book is not for certain folk, but for all folk that are traveling the interstates or relationships, the highways of systematic oppression, the dusty roads of inequality, the thoroughfares of racial discrimination, the back roads of unfair legislation, and the dead end streets of false promises and fake petitions, phony individuals. God has given us a book so that we won't be lost call the Holy Bible. The word helps us now. If we go back and look at verse 27. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write thou these words, 
For after the tenor of these words, I have made a covenant with thee and with Israel. These passages are crucial when we think about the Bible. I heard somebody say that the Bible as an acronym are you know, the basic instructions before leaving earth, B-I-B-L-E. The rudiments of scripture are found in what we call the Old Testament consistent of the first five books of the Bible, the five books of Moses, the Torah that we call the law that's in the scripture. The law, the commandments, is our context is ours. Well, God called Moses a second time to Mount Sinai and commissioned Moses and conferred upon Moses to hear, observe, and pay attention to what needs to be written as what thus saith the Lord. Too often, rather than pay attention to God and God's words, we come up with our own words, our own cliches and slogans. Some of us have another Bible. It's not a holy Bible. But you have something that guides your, your inner thoughts and guides your undergirding way of living. And while we live in a time of grace and extended mercy and God's love, it does not mean that you and I can have other gods. It does not mean that we can avoid rest. It does not mean that we can avoid worship. It does not mean that we can take what belongs to us, Russia. So Moses, write these words, because I have made a covenant with you in Israel. The Old and New Testaments are really covenants. The covenant of the Old and New Testament. And the covenant that we look at today is the Mosaic covenant. But then God made covenants with Abraham, the Abraham Hamid covenant, which contains promises from God. God is always making promises. God is always making covenants with his people. The Bible in basic English called it an agreement, where parties involved have made commitments. But the issue in this text is not the covenant about two parties being in agreement, but a sovereign God that declares an agreement. In other words, it's not about you agreeing with God, but God declares something on humanity in order to bless his people. A God that promises to intervene, don't forget about Ukraine, God. A God that declares to protect you even when you don't know you need protecting. A God that provides for us when you don't even know how to fully provide for yourself. He provides for Israel while living in a foreign land. Believe it or not, we're still in need of God's promises and God's covenant. Because just like Israel, we all are still living in a foreign land. Yes, we are. One of the biggest lies among many lies in America is a song that says, this land is your land, and this land is my land. From California to the New York Island, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters, this land was made, this is what the song said, for you and me. If this land was made for you and me, why is it that when I'm driving in my car, I'm still wondering if the police might pull me over? Or if I'm driving down the highway, if I might make it home? If this land was made for you and me, why do black families and blended families and persons of color have to still have that talk with their children about how to act and carry themselves when they have done no wrong? If this land was made for you and me, why do wealthy people use fancy words to steal from poor people like gentrification and mixed market housing and redlining and 
displacement and racial profiling and just downright. If this land was made for you and me, we would have to fight and wonder about voting rights and why they play tricks and games every time it's time to go to the poll. He helps us in Exodus 34 and 28. He was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did neither eat bread, look at that, nor drink water. And he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. While the word fasting is not used in the text, the idea of fasting 40 days and 40 nights without food or water is a miracle in itself. You know, some of us can't go four hours without putting something on our stomach. There are mixed professional medical teachings and opinions on how long a person can live without food or water. Partly because there's no ethical way of medically and scientifically testing a person starving to see how far they can go before dying. But there are instances throughout history where people have been in real life critical situations where they've been without food if they were trapped in a cave or a mining incident and lasted for days and some had gone weeks without food and water but not on purpose. What, what are we getting at? Lent season starts on next Wednesday and it's time for those of us in the Lord to fast. See, Jesus not only talked about praying, but we read in Matthew 6 and 16 when he said, When you fast, be not as the hypocrites. Yes, we hear much on praying, and we hear much on how to live, and we hear much on reading the word. We hear much on going to church. We hear much on tithing and serving. But there are times in this life, my brothers and sisters, that just like you pray and read, that we need to what? To fast. When we fast, a real fast, well, some people say, well, I gave up chocolate cake. Some people say I gave up some candy and I gave up shopping and shopping online. But what about, what about a real fast? What about really giving something up? What, what about turning the plate down for real? What about not going on Facebook for What about cutting the television up? What, what about shutting the laptop down? What about cutting the smartphone off? What about putting the tablet down? J just for a while, Moses fasted in witness. And we read in Exodus 32 and 16, and the tables were the work of God, listen now, and the writing was the writing of God graven upon the tables. There are some verses that say that Moses cut the stones and wrote the words, but nothing is done without the permission and authority and strength of God. And Exodus 31 and 8 collaborates that the words were written by the finger of God on the tables. There are some translations that rather than say table, use the words tablets to say that long before there was screen technology, long before, listen, there were touch screens, smart boards, long before there were blackboards and Crayola markers and chalk, God was already using his finger as a stylus on stones to imprint and write codes and to swipe things down. We, we need to be careful of our limitless thinking that technology is just so recent as if we are really doing something. Technology is not our savior. It is only a tool. It should not displace or replace human contact. Thank you, Dr. Barbara Fitzhugh, who taught a Bible study last week called Limited, 
where she talked about even humanity's greatest accomplishments and achievements is still limited in every way, still flawed in any way. Because even with technology, when you have a Zoom link right, sometimes you still can't connect. You can have all the expensive equipment you can and sometimes can't even turn it on. But what we love about God, God, what you say, he still reigns? God has no limits, but we have limits. You have limits and I have limits and the government have limits. We walk around sometimes as though we really, really did something, but, but who am I? And, and what am I to God? Who, who are you? And what are you to God? Who, who are we? And what are we to God when we think about When we think about God who has no restrictions and no stipulations and no limitations, when we think about God who cannot be hired or fired and cannot be appointed or even elected, when we think about God who does not take a vacation or retire from his throne, when we think about God and all of his sovereignty and his omnipotence and his infinite existence, when we think about God and all of his goodness, when we think about God and all of his blessings on our life, when we think about God and all of his wonderful and matchless and marvelous and sometimes mysterious and unexplainable blessings and love that he bestows upon the sinner day after day, what a mighty God we serve. The angels bow before him. Heaven and earth, they adore him. What a mighty God we serve. But then finally we hear in Exodus 34 and 29, and it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount, that Moses wist not that the skin of his face, thank you, Lord, shone while he talked with him. When you look at the book that is to help us to not be lost, a few things ought to happen in our lives. Number one, a change ought to come over you. And number two, you ought to be having something in your heart and in your hands. So there was Moses on Mount Sinai having been with God face to face. And the word reminds us that a change came over him. The Episcopal priest Mary C. Early, contributor in the upper room discipline, said this, that Moses come down from the mountain, a changed man with a changed face. It seems that there's a need for people to step into the presence of God in order for a change. Sometimes you can try so many other things and leave God out of the equation. But we hear the say that if you really want to change, you need to step in the presence, thank you Lord, of God. Because when you have been with God, not just online and Facebook, but been with the Lord, not only on Sunday morning, when you've been with God, a change ought to come over you. When you spend time with God, a change ought to come over your heart. A change ought to show up on your body. A change ought to come on your face where you're no longer the same. How can a pretty face claim to be with God and still look ugly? How can blessed and highly favored individuals spend time in church and still cuss people out after church? How can when you spend time with God not change and not have what you need in your life? Because when you spend time with God, a change will come over you. When you spend time with prayer, a change will come over you. When you spend time reading
reading the word. A change will come over you when you spend time in the mountain with God. A change will come over you when you spend time in devotion. A change will come over you when you spend time in reflection. A change will come over you when you spend time online, church hopping from one place to another. A change will come over you when you go dropping, when you go Instagram skipping, when you do Twitter bouncing, when God a change ought to come over you. But the part of this change was Moses carrying something not only in his heart but in his hands. He went up with nothing but then came down with something. The word said that he had two tables of testimony. The modern King James and New King James version said that he had tablets. And whether you realize it or not, not all tablets are found on the internet. Yes, thank you, Lord. Not all tablets are found at Best Buy locations. And if you're putting two and two together, not all tablets are found on Amazon.com, and not all tablets were developed by Samsung Galaxy, and not all tablets, I'm sorry, iPad folks, are found on Apple stores. But here in the Word, we learn that God came from the cloud. I almost say our cloud, but came from the clouds. And went online in the mountains. In order his understudy Moses to make use of the technology of the day. And he took some stone tablets and imprinted some words and some codes and some characters and put some letters on a tablet that were not made by Apple and not made by Samsung. Tablets that were not made by Kindle or Microsoft Surface or even Lenovo. But these were tablets like the Green Book that became a guide on how to travel the dangerous, yes, roads of life. Tablets like the Green Book that tells you where it's safe and unsafe. Tablets that tell us how to live and not live. Tablets that tell us where to go and not go. What to do and not to do. Tablets which tell us which roles to take and not take. Tablets that tell us which paths to take and not take. Tells us which places to visit and not visit. And what God to worship and not worship. And if we take the tablets, I'm not talking about human tablets, but God's divine, technological, and spiritually engineered tablets, if we take the tablets, we'll find that they are in a place to help us so we don't get lost. Because too many people are in the world lost. President Putin is lost. His good friend, I won't call his name, but he's lost. White supremacists are lost. Bullies are lost. Racist folk are lost. Violent people are lost. Evil people are lost. Misguided people are lost. Uninformed people are lost. And people that play shells with voting are lost. But if we take the tablets, they have 66 apps that have already been preloaded and downloaded and uploaded. If we take the tablets, they have automatic updates every time you turn it on. If you take the tablets that speak to all people, if you take the tablets that speak to all races, if you take the tablets that speak to all income levels, if you take the tablets that speak to all nations, if you take the tablets that speak to your unique situation, if you take the tablets and open every day like you do Facebook, if you take the tablets like every day checking your email, if you take the tablets when you look at your accounts, if you take the tablets every day like you post online, you will find out that you won't be lost. You will find out like the psalmist who said in Psalms 119, 105, that the word is a lamp 
unto my feet and a light unto my path. If you take the tablet, you'll find out like John that the Word was made flesh and it dwells among us and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, which is full of grace and truth. If you take the tablet, you'll find like Isaiah said that the Word will go forth and it will not turn void. If you take the tablet by Paul, took time to tell Timothy that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, is profitable for reproof, is profitable for correction, and profitable for the instruction of righteousness. But can I tell you what Jesus said? Can I tell you what Jesus said? Can I tell you what Jesus said about the tablet? what he said about the law and the prophet. He said, heaven and earth shall pass away. But my word will not pass away. So in the word, you will find a source. In the word, you will find God. In the word, you will have his assurance. In the word, you will have God's promises. In the word, you will find direction. In the word, you will your thoughts. In the word you will find food for the soul. In the word you will find help for the weary. In the word you will find fuel for every day. But more importantly in the word you will learn about God. In the word you will learn about the creator. In the word you will learn about Jesus. In the word you will learn about the Savior. In the word you will learn the Holy Spirit. In the Word, you will learn about His love for you. In the Word, you will learn about salvation for everybody. In the